Thank you for tuning in to Emerges Week. We are excited to be joined by Mama and Sheila Jayapal, who is also an Emerge Oregon alum. Commissioner Jayapal was born in India and came to the United States when she was in college. An Oregonian since 1944. So Sheila has been deeply engaged in the community throughout that time as a volunteer, advocate, and the mother of two. She is a lawyer by training, holding a number of professional legal positions, including general counsel for Adidas America. Her diverse experiences prepared her for the multifaceted role of county commissioner. As a commissioner, she, along with other commissioners, oversees the annual budget process to ensure that public resources are distributed as an equitable, sustainable, and compassionate manner. Thank you so much for joining us, Commissioner. How are you? I am well, Eva. It's really good to be here. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. All right, so why don't we jump right into it? The big question, <laughs> COVID-19. Um, the world is opening up, uh, a little bit of good news, but we know that COVID-19 has uh, and will continue to have a devastating impact on every community. And elected officials like yourself have been on the front lines of helping families through this time. What does recovery look like in Monoma County and what are your, what are you doing to support your community? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, in terms of the front line, what I want to say is the people on the front lines are our healthcare workers, our public health workers, our caregivers, our shelter, yes, our shelter givers. Those are the folks on the front lines. And I am so grateful for what they've been doing over the past 15 or so months. Um, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in, in Multnomah County as throughout the country. Um, but not all of us are approaching that light at the same rate. And so what I am really focused on, what Multnomah County is really focused on, is ensuring that we have an equitable recovery. That is that everybody comes out of this stronger. Um, and so the things that I am very focused on, equitable vaccine distribution. We still have too many people in our communities of color who either because of a lack of access or because of understandable concerns, including, for example, not being able to time, take time off if they have to recover from a vaccine shot, still haven't gotten access to the vaccine. And that is, you know, throughout the crisis, our number one focus has been on reaching those communities that are hardest hit and vaccine uptake is critical to, to, to the recovery. My second focus is on our kids. From the beginning, I have thought that the longest term impact is going to be on our children and youth. And I think that as we come out of this, what a recovery looks like is providing kids, especially the ones who already have the greatest barriers, the support that they need to get back into school and to be able to catch up um, and, and move ahead. And then the third piece is economic stability for our families, particularly, again, for our families who have been hardest hit by the pandemic. And in this case, as in all cases with equity, one size does not fit, fit all. You know, we have people need employment, um, but they also need things like credit recovery. They need things like skill building. And so being really focused about how we set our families back on that path to economic stability, I think is the third um, key focus of mine as, as we come out of this and move into the recovery. Always a champion for equity, uh, and we do know that there are some some folks a little bit more affected by the um, COVID nineteen than others. Uh, you know, there's been some uh, reports that women women of color have been really hit economically by the pandemic. So, so happy to have you there, and really thinking very hard about those. You know, making sure there's an equitable recovery. Um, housing is one of your big priorities. Um, can you tell us how you are supporting families and individuals so that they can obtain affordable housing? Yeah, well, um, Portland, like all West Coast cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, is facing a houselessness crisis. We were facing that crisis before the pandemic, and it has been exacerbated over the last 15 months. So that is my, you know, after pandemic recovery, that is my number one priority. Um, it's caused by a lot of things, including primarily federal disinvestment from public housing and skyrocketing rents. So the solutions are things like rent assistance. In Portland, we have 24 neighborhoods and not one of them is affordable for the average black, Latino, native or single mom led household, right? So the problem is affordability. 
And until the federal government gets back in the business of building public housing, the best way to create affordability is to pay people's rents. So in May, the voters of Multnomah County, thank you, voters of Multnomah County, passed a groundbreaking ballot measure that creates funding for providing people rent assistance and the supportive services that they need to stay housed. And um, that, I, I believe it is the largest, in terms of dollars, the largest per capita funding stream for housing and supportive services in the country. So I am very, I have been advocating for rent assistance from the beginning of my term, long-term rent assistance. And my focus going forward in terms of affordable housing is to make sure that the funding from that measure creates affordable housing for people. And, you know, um, people who earn a minimum wage cannot afford a two bedroom apartment in Multnomah County, right? Working families cannot afford an apartment. Um, I think for too long, we have resisted the idea of just paying people's rent and we need to get over it. We need to pay people's rent and we need to give them the services that they need to stay in their apartment once they've found it. Not crazy gr groundbreaking. <laughs> Um, amazing, very good work. And in um, addition to housing, uh, you're taking all the big issues. Uh, as part of the county commissioner, you co-chair uh, and chair several committees on sex trafficking and domestic violence. Um, can you tell us more about why this is one of your priorities and how are you addressing these programs in your community? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I asked for those assignments and I asked for them because the survivors of domestic violence and sex trafficking are among the most marginalized in our communities. Again, disproportionately people of color, disproportionately LGBTQ, and particularly trans people of color. And because um, domestic violence in particular, I think for too long has been treated, even after decades of work by amazing advocates, it's still treated as this sort of separate ancillary form of violence and as disconnected from the other issues that we face. Actually, it's deeply connected to all of the other issues. You know, a, a high percentage, about a third of people experiencing homelessness in my region have experienced domestic violence. Nationally, if you look at women in prisons and jails, 60%, shockingly high number, have experienced domestic and sexual violence. So very connected to all of these other issues. That's why these are issues that are important to me. Um, here, what I am really focused on is changing our systems so that they are responsive to what survivors actually tell us they need. Right now, we have limited options for survivors. We provide them some short-term shelter, some short-term money, and we offer them prosecution of the abusers. And that is a path, but it's not the only path. And it's not the path that survivors are necessarily asking for. Often what they're asking for, back to economic stability, the economic and financial means that allow them to escape cycles of abuse. So we are taking a hard look at our systems and really trying to transform them so that they are responsive to survivor voice. And such an important part to show that intersectionality between housing, um, you know, a person of housing victim and a domestic violence victim, a solution for one is also a solution for others, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Um, and finally, <laughs> uh, this is an emerge series, so I can't let you go without asking about running for office. Uh, what advice do you have for women thinking about running? Yeah. Well, first, I, I you know, I, I want to let your viewers know that I serve on a board of commissioners that is all women. All five of us are women and three of us are women of color. So, yes. And, and thanks to the good work of Emerge, many of us have come through the Emerge system. So thank you. Um, my advice, first of all, figure out um, how you want to serve, why you want to serve, not necessarily why you want to run for office, but why you want to serve and what you wanna do. I think too often when people think about running for office, they identify the position. They say, I wanna be a state legislator. I wanna be a county commissioner. I wanna be a congressperson. But really start with what you wanna work on. What are the issues that you're passionate about? And then figure out based on those issues, what position allows you to have the most impact. And then my other uh, big piece of advice is, you know, work hard, be open, listen, 
create networks, your networks are going to be what take you through that path to elected office and are going to be what make you successful once you're there. Wow, that was a twofer. <laughs> you asked me, I didn't stop. <laughs> no, fantastic. I love finding your why because I'm also pretty sure a lot of these priorities you have were a reason why you start, wanted to run for her. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner, for joining us. And to our viewers, um, thank you uh, for joining us at another episode of Emerge at Work. Subscribe to our channel for updates and more great conversations with Emerge leaders from coast to coast. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Bye.